the Ortho PAC, hosted by Sam Dyer. Welcome to the Ortho PAC, where we discuss up-to-date orthopedic topics for the busy clinician. I invite you to sit back and relax as I attempt to fill in the gaps between education, current events, and real-world practice. Welcome, listeners, today. Dr. Toon will be on our podcast. I wanted to discuss some topics of interest. Dr. Toon is a medical doctor who has training in anesthesia and a fellowship in pain management and works with some chronic pain patients in our practice. Dr. Toon, welcome to our podcast today. Thank you. How are you? I'm good. Thanks. We're, we're glad to have you. Please tell us how your practice is similar or different than physiatry. I have an anesthesiology background. My residency was in anesthesiology, and then I did a fellowship afterwards in pain management. So that's a little bit different than physiatry because their residency and then their continued fellowship or training after that is all geared towards physiatry medicine. So that's a little bit about the training. As far as what I do now, my training as far as anesthesia based, we were more uh, based our our background, our training was more focused on spine, so cervical, thoracic, lumbar type issues. I also would do procedures for people with something called complex regional pain syndrome, do sympathetic blocks, things like that. I did do some training with joint injections, but that was not a primary source of training um, in our in our studies. And I think that's where we probably differ the most with, in comparison, sorry, to physiatry. Physiatry is more looking at not only just spine, but a lot of different joints. As I have worked with physiatrists, so my last two practices, my current practice and the practice that I was in previously, I was with a physiatry group. And so I learned a lot about joint injections and I'm still learning today. (laughs) So I would say the difference is that there's probably a little bit more musculoskeletal versus neurological and anesthesia. Thanks for pointing those differences out. I wanted to explore a little bit more about the patient conditions you treat. I know you said uh, about the complex regional pain. What are some other things that you might treat? What are some other common situations? Most of my patients are patients who have some type of spine back neck issue. So we see a lot from surgeons where, you know, the patient is trying to avoid surgery. So they might have a disc herniation, don't want to receive a surgery. So we go in and we may do like epidural steroid injections or something like that to help with that. That's my primary bread and butter for what I do most of the day. I do see, like I said, complex regional pain syndrome, which is, you know, an entity in itself and is kind of an outlier. I see joints, like if you have hip, knee, shoulder pain, I do injections for that. Sometimes people have spine arthritis and I treat that. That's something that's not very much looked at because it's not necessarily a surgical issue, but it does affect people and impact people a lot, especially this time of year, just like arthritis and any other type of any other region of the body, cold weather will aggravate the arthritis in your spine. So I do see a lot of that, especially, like I said, this time of year, fibromyalgia patients, I see some of that as well. We're talking about referrals to you. What would you consider a good referral versus a bad referral? And I know, you know, you want to stay busy and stuff, but I was talking to one of your predecessors a long time ago, and he said that, you know, as long as people have pain, I'll be busy. So uh, sometimes (laughs) It's a little overwhelming, I'm sure, but what would be a good referral for us to send for you? It really does. And this is something that me and my colleagues discuss a lot. I feel like, you know, when people are sent to a chronic pain practice or to a pain practice, because I do treat some acute pain as well. I should clarify that we treat both acute and chronic pain. But I think people typically look at us as the last resort. And a lot of times, by the time people get to me, the things that I could have done to help them maybe early on where they were would have been more beneficial, the treatments would have been more beneficial, we, we are beyond that point. So I really would hope that when someone comes into their primary care, or to their the orthopedic surgeon or, you know, whoever, if someone's complaining of pain, we are one of the first resources that a, a physician or a provider would think of to send a patient to because there are things that if we do with them pretty early on, we can get ahead of the situation. And especially in an acute pain scenario, we can hopefully prevent it from becoming a chronic pain issue. 
I also see a lot of patients who, for some reason or another, they've gotten in with a provider somewhere where they are on a lot of different medications, hosts a huge dose of narcotics. And that's something that's, you know, especially this day and age, people don't really want to deal with and they send them to us and we are happy to help. But that's not something that most of us want to continue on, you know, continue to have these patients on these high doses of narcotics because that doesn't really work well as we can now see. Once upon a time, thoughts were different. I know we'll talk about that maybe later, but we don't really want to just take on every body that has narcotics and just continue that on. And I think patients come into us thinking, oh, you're just going to continue what I'm on. And we're here to kind of help navigate the whole body. And we're thinking not just short term, but long term. And we do understand that long term, these high dose narcotics can cause more harm than good. And so we're really here to try to help people come up with alternatives to just narcotics for the treatment of pain, because there's so many other options out there. Along those lines, if we talk about folks with chronic pain, and I, I hear what you're saying, you know, that it's better to start sooner than later, but we, we have a lot of patients in orthopedics with chronic pain, chronic back issues that we are non-surgical or and you referred to this back in the day, back when I started, and, and we've talked about this on other podcasts, that you were a bad provider if you didn't treat patients' pain. There was a big under-treatment of pain, and now we kind of come full circle, and there's an opioid crisis, and I don't want to, you know, glager that point or go into the details, but has that changed how you practice? And if so, how? Along that line, I know you're interested in healthy alternatives for patients with chronic pain. So I was hoping you might give us a kind of a full gamut, you know, like how might you start and how can you manage people and what other options are available? So I'm with you whenever I was in training, I was, I was in probably the back end of that, like the sky is the limit. There's no ceiling. You can just keep increasing people on a certain amount of, or increasing the dose of opioids that people were taking that to try to reach this optimum pain score number. <laughs> and yes, and you're right, you're considered a bad physician or a provider if you did not somehow reach that number and it didn't matter what dose that looked like. <laughs> and being an anesthesiologist, understanding a lot of the pharmacology and some of the medications that we, some of the opioids that we use for treatment of chronic pain, we also use to put people to sleep. And it would be like very alarming to me that some patients were on doses of medications that we would consider that could put you under for general anesthesia, but they were, they were walking around because they were just kind of used to this type of medicine every day. Again, I was, I was brought up in that era. And so, you know, you just kept increasing the dose, increasing the dose as they tolerated it. In my practice, I started to see things even before they became common practice. Like a lot of my patients never could reach that magic number, first of all. So you're just building up a tolerance. And then, so you increase the pain medication. It might work for a few weeks or even maybe a few months, but then, okay, doc, that's no longer working. And then you just continue to increase it. With that said, those patients become more debilitated. So I would see that patients who are completely functional and working were no longer able to really get out of bed and function and maintain a job. And then as time went on, I began to see how health-wise, it's like, wow, you know, and maybe it was just not being able to get up and move that played into this, but I started to see a lot of like heart disease and diabetes in these patients. And more so than with patients that were not on high doses or not on opioids at all. And so I began to see that before a lot of the studies came out showing kind of the detrimental effects of um, opioids long-term. And so I started to back down before it became a general practice that, yeah, maybe, or a thought process that maybe we are doing the wrong thing. And I, I was fortunate enough to be in a group at that time that also began to see the light. <laughs> and we kind of, as a group decided that, you know, maybe this is not the right thing. The patients were really resistant at first, but then after you started to explain, like, this is what I'm seeing, and maybe we can work this out on a lower dose. And, you know, the whole key is for you to function. We want people to be better so they can live a quality of life. And the, to me, being in bed all day is not a good quality of life. And so that leads me to the next part. So I also am currently going through some studies to try to get what I call, what they call a lifestyle medicine certification. So I'll be board certified in lifestyle medicine. And that really focuses on changes in your diet, increase in exercise, 
And the studies in making these changes have been so dramatic. Like you can really like chronic disease in general, just not, not just chronic pain, but people who have heart disease, people who are diabetic, you can literally change the course of that disease process by modifying your diet and increasing your exercise. And I know what people who have chronic back pain and joint pain, when you first mentioned that, they are like, I can't do that, doc. I can't do that. And I'm like, well, you know, we haven't really tried. You know, a lot of times it's just that, you know, because people have this idea in their mind, like, I can't do this. So they don't really try. So it's a lot of fear there. And it's a mindset change. You have to really work with people. And I, I can't do that alone. I'm fortunate here to, at Emerge Ortho, I have an excellent psychologist on staff that can help me with helping these patients kind of change their thought process initially. And then, you know, you can get them on board with a nutritionist. We have excellent physical therapists here at Emerge Ortho. That um, So it, it has been really good to have everybody just kind of on site. But even before that, I had, you know, I would refer, refer people out to psychologists and physical therapists to try to help me with my patients to help them gain increased functional ability. And at the same time, we're weaning their pain medications. And I have yet to have someone who we wean their pain medications down or even completely off that said, oh, that was a mistake. Everyone just was very thankful and felt like their quality of life was so much better with just making these lifestyle changes. Even the things that we eat, you know, I, I am a sugar addict. I love chocolate. I love cookies and cake, but I do know that I have to be careful with that. And not just because, you know, it might increase your blood sugar and you might become a diabetic, but it also has a significant impact on pain. So sugar is a very inflammatory agent. And so if you have arthritis and you, or you're like me and you just love your sweets, you have to, you know, you have to be mindful. And most of my patients, when I start telling them like, maybe let's just cut back on this. And then they'll start to say, oh yeah, my pain is better since I I made this change in my diet. So it's very interesting to see. And I'm still learning a lot with the training that I'm going through for this lifestyle medicine certification. I'm really excited to incorporate more of that into my practice. Glad to hear that. It's a definite process. Anybody that's tried to lose weight or tried to start an exercise program or any New Year's resolution for that matter, it's tough to stay on track. It's tough to do it. So I can imagine when it comes to, you know, patients that have been on pain meds for a long time or have this chronic issue, it's hard to get them to change. But if you can change behaviors, you can change the course, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Like I said, it's just a mindset shift, you know, with anything, you know. <laughs> yeah, sure. Dr. Toon, this is a great podcast. We're going to get a lot of information out of this to our listeners. I appreciate your time today. I know you're busy. I really uh, look forward to hearing this coming out. Oh, yes, me too. Thank you for joining the Ortho PAC podcast. Hello, listeners. I wanted to tell you about our next upcoming conference, the Ortho in the West, February the 18th through the 20th, 2022, which will be in Phoenix, Arizona. We have quite a few sports topics and trauma topics, and we hope you can join us there.